In this screencast, um, we are going to talk about color mixing, and it's um, color is really one of my favorite topics. When we look at chemistry, there are um, just a lot to do with chemistry and color. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that when we talk about color, um, it really spans, or color science, really spans the, the areas of chemistry and biology and physics and psychology. And so we talked a lot about that in module two, but we're going to dig around a little bit more in to color theory and some ways that we classify color and mix color in this module. So in the last module, we talked a lot about light and how we see, or there are different, different um, wavelengths of light that can um, translate into color, right? And so the process of turning light into color can be broken down broadly into four steps. And the first step here is that a spectrum of light is emitted from a source. Now, that source can be anything from, like, for example, the sun or a fluorescent bulb or a fire, right, etc. So there's some sort of source of light. Now, the light then will strike an object, right, or material or surface, okay? Now, when this happens, some of the light is absorbed. Right? And then some is reflected. And this is usually in the form of multiple wavelengths of light. Okay? Now, the next step is that some of the wavelengths are detected by our visual system, right? And then what happens in kind of this fourth step um, is there's a psychology of perception. Ooh, I misspelled psychology. Let me, nope, I'm just going to start over. And when we talk about the psychology perception, what we're really talking about here is um, basically where the mechanics of our brain develop or determine, let's use determine instead, which colors we perceive. Okay. Now, although these steps seem simple, right? This process can be really complicated. Step four particularly is where I think things get really tricky. Um, basically, we're going to take a whopping amount of information and try to make the best sense of it, all while not becoming overwhelmed, or our brain does, right? Um, and so our visual system uses a whole host of cues to help us determine the colors that we see. Um, and the light reflected at us from a particular point is just one of those cues. So as we try to make sense of the objects in front of us, we have to construct their shapes and the light source that's illuminating them um, 
and the wider visual field which they sit and the color that fills their boundaries. And so we have to take all of this into account. Um, and it's, it's one of the reasons um, as an artist that you have to be kind of careful of patterns because your brain really wants to um, kind of make things simpler by making patterns, which is interesting, or I think is interesting. So let's dig around a little bit more into the biology of how we see this, okay? So we have light, right? And it's going to strike an object. Well, when that light hits our eye, right, it stimulates a part of our brain called retina. So when light hits our eye, it stimulates a part of our brain called the retina, right? And it's really, and so I have a example of an eyeball here. Um, you can see here's the front part of the eyeball. And so here is the retina. Now we also have an optical nerve and rods and cones, which we're going to talk about in the next couple slides. But I did want to go ahead and point those out that we have cone cells in our eye as well as rod cells. And again, we're going to talk about these, but I wanted to go ahead and point them out. Now, in the retina, this is really where color perception starts, okay? So color perception starts in the retina, right? And so the retina is really just a thin three layer of cells um, about the thickness of a credit card in the back of the eye. So it's approximately three layers of cells in the back of the eye, about the thickness of a credit card. Okay. Um, now, the retina um, is made up of brain tissue that separates from the brain during the development of the fetus, but remains connected to the brain via the optic nerve. Okay. So the optic nerve here connects the retina to the brain. Okay. Now, the retina performs really the first most important step in visual information processing um, in that it responds to the light that hits our eye. And what it does with that light is it turns it into a neural signal. Okay. And that neural signal is what the brain can understand, basically. So inside our retina, as already mentioned, there's a number of different kinds of photoreceptor cells. Um, and what happens is um, when we see this neural signal, right, um, is that we, when it's sent to the brain, the eventual result is that we see kind of this world of color during the day, right, and shades of gray at night, okay? So basically, when we, if we were to sum up the retina, which I've, I've given you a lot of notes here, but if we were to sum up the retina, um, we would say, look, the retina feeds information via the optic nerve into areas of the brain 
that process images okay and so that's what the retina does now as i said we've got rod and cone cells and so let's talk about what those are okay now i have a little bit different image here um i like this image a little bit uh here because it shows kind of the rod and cone cells um that make up the layer kind of in the back of the eye okay now so what are rods rods are the photoreceptor cells in our retina that allow us to see in the dim light, right, and the dark, okay? Um, now, there's only one type of rod, Okay, so we only have one type of rod, um, but there are approximately 120 million of them within each of our retinas. I think about 120 million there for a second. Right now. Basically, what we're going to see here is that rods dominate, right, when very little light is available. Okay. Um, so basically, at night or in a dark room, when no no or little color is visible and we see mostly black, whites, and grays, okay? Rods are really efficient light collectors. They're very highly sensitive to small amounts of light and to changes in light. So sensitive that just one photon can be detected. Now, that, that seems kind of like a throwaway sentence. You can detect one photon of light. But if we were to use an analogy, your eye detecting one photon is like feeling one microscopic speck of dust landing on your skin. And so that's pretty cool. Now, so those are rods. Rods, again, we're going to use mostly when it's dark, right? And they're going to pick up those changes in light. Now, what are, so what are cones? Okay. Well, cones are the photoreceptor cells in our retina that are central to our color vision, right? So, when we talk about cones, there are going to be three types, okay, um, versus only one type of rod, okay? Now, that being said, there are fewer cones than rods. So, we have fewer cones in our eyes than rods, right? Um, and basically, that ratio is one cone to 20 rods okay. now unlike rods cones are going to dominate in the daytime or in bright light so these are going to dominate in bright light okay so rods dominate in dark light cones are going to dominate in really bright light um, they also, cones also differ from rods in that they allow for what we call a high acuity. So when we talk about rods, we talk about a low acuity. And when we talk about acuity, this means just a sharpness of, 
perception. Okay. So, um, and that sharpness of perception in our vision, um, as far as cones are concerned, um, be because they allow for a high acuity, right? Um, they are not sensitive to small shifts in light. Right? So cones on our own don't tell us what colors we are seeing. Um, the signals from the cones that are produced uh, further by the retina and then are transmitted to the rest of our brain and that eventually translates them into the perception of color, okay? Now, I said there are three different types of cones. So the first type of cone is the L cone, right? And L cones are sensitive to longer Wavelengths of light. In the visible spectrum. Right. And this corresponds to kind of if we're longer uh, wavelengths of light in the visible spectrum, this is going to correspond to kind of that color red. So a lot of times these are called a red cones or they're shown in images as red cones. Okay. The second type of cone is an M cone, okay? And these are sensitive to medium wavelengths of light in that visible spectrum. And so what that means is that these are gonna correspond to green. And so sometimes these are called green cones or they're shown as green. And then the third type are S cones. Okay. And these are going to be sensitive to shorter wavelengths of light, um, which would correspond to blue. So sometimes they're called blue cones. Okay. So those are the three cones that make up our, our cones that detect, um, help us detect color in our eyes. Now, because we have three kinds of cones in our retinas, we're called trichromates, okay? Or it's referred to as uh, trichromacy, okay? So when we, have, when we talk about trichromacy, it's because we have three. So tri is the prefix for three types of cones. Now, I love this image because it's corresponding that wavelength that we talked about in module two to the different types of cones. So here is your S cone with blue. There's your M cone in um, green. And here's your L cone. And it's shown as red. But what's interesting is this really corresponds a little bit better to yellow. So I find that to be really interesting. Now, these three cone types carry the information that allow us to see the range of colors across the visible spectrum. And what's more important a lot of times is the different combinations of spectral colors that make up the world. So not only does this help us see red, green, and blue, but it helps us see all of the different combinations. Now, our cones are not equally sensitive to all the colors in the visible spectrum. Right? Um, and, and so what we can see here from this image is that in fact, cones have peak sensitivities only in narrow bands of the spectrum. Right. But that information they pass on really enables us to see the millions of colors around us because our brain has the ability to compare the activity in each type of cone cell. Okay.
And so I want to dig around into that just a little bit. So how does our brain compare this activity? So you might think that when red light hits our retina, the cones that are sensitive to longer wavelengths of light, which would be our L cones, would be activated and signal our brains to see red. Okay, but that's not really how it happens. All of these three cones are active simultaneously. And so our visual system compares the activity in all three cone types and adds up the output of each to find out where the greatest activity is taking place. So all three of these are active at the same time. And then the L cone will say, hey, look, this is where most of the activity is taking place. Okay. Now, when there are equal amounts of activity in all three cones, we see light, white light. Okay. Now, this ability to compare cone activity is what allows us to see colors that our cones are not particularly sensitive to, right? Um, and so, as I mentioned before, our L cones are actually sensitive to yellow light. Right? Not red, but they are what helps us see red. Right? So when the L cones are more active than the M and the S cones, our visual system uses this information and then further interprets it, which results in the perception of red. Okay, and so that is an example of how these work. Now, um, we might, the next kind of burning question on your heart, and this whole module is set up in kind of color questions or things that are interesting about color, um, is that, okay, that's great. So then why does the same color look different depending on the light source? And so I want you to look at, at these images here, okay? These are M&Ms, right, or color candies, and they're in three different light sources. And so in the three different light sources, the colors that we see are different, right? So when we change, the light source illuminating an object The object itself will reflect different wavelengths of light, okay? And that will cause the color of the object to change. Right now, uh, just kind of broadly, there are two light sources. The first light source is incandescent light. Okay, and we talk about incandescent light, this is created by heat, which includes things like the sun, right fire or like a tungsten lamp, right? And then the second source is um, what we would consider luminescent. So when we talk about luminesc ooh, luminescent light, um, it is not heat-based, right? And it comes from... like things like fluorescent lights, 
LEDs, right? Monitors or televisions, okay? Now, here's the deal. Luminescent light only emits um, light from parts of the spectrum, right? As opposed to like the sun, which is going to emit light from all the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, right? Um, so when we talk about this, right, depending on the type or the kind of incandescent or luminescent light source present, the number of wavelengths reflected back from an illuminated object can be limited or expanded, which basically can change the color that we see, okay? Um, and so if an object absorbs light from a source with a wide spectrum, like daylight, it will reflect more wavelengths. So look at this candy, okay? This top image was taken in daylight, okay? And so what we're seeing here is that because daylight has, is a source with a wide spectrum of um, colors, right? It reflects more wavelengths. Right? So then look at, let's compare that to an object um, that absorbs light from a source that emits light from one end of the spectrum, okay? So if we look at the second photo, this second photo was taken under red and green um, theater lights. Okay, now that's why it looks, there's a green kind of lens here and a red lens here, okay? So we've got red and green theater lights. Now, the red and green light really covers most of our visible spectrum, except for red and blue, okay? So red and green light cover most of our visible spectrum except red and blue, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, I said red and blue. I meant to say blue and violet. Blue and violet, okay? That's why in this particular um, image here, Okay, those blue candies really appear to be dark green. Now, if you are looking at this in the screencast and maybe your printer's off or, or even worse, you're looking at this in black and white um, and you're like, Dr. Pierce, I just don't see this dark green color. Um, I'm going to try to remember to bring this to class, but as you know, sometimes I'm forgetful, but I have a better picture of this in the book, What is Color? So this comes from the book, What is Color? And this shows up as just a true dark green. There's, there's almost no blue, right? Which, or there is no blue, which is really, I think, interesting. But remember, these objects are reflecting the light that it puts on them. Now, what I feel like makes this even more evident is this image right here. So this, these are the same candies, right? But they are now illuminated using a yellow... Um, laser light with a wavelength of 589 nanometers. So we just have like one wavelength, okay? Whereas this up here was really, really broad, right? It's all the wavelengths of daylight. Here, this was just red and green, okay? But now here we're getting even more specific. We're sitting down here and we're saying, look, this is just yellow. This is just 598 nanometers. 
And I want you to look. The candies here now all appear yellow because there's no other wavelengths of light for the other candies to reflect. So this is why colors look different depending on the light source. It's because they are reflecting off the colors back to us, to our eyes, which I think is really interesting. Now, right? Maybe then the next thing we really need to talk about is we're saying, okay, hey, look, Dr. Pierce, okay, I get it. There are different light sources and that's why these appear different but not everybody sees the same types of color and you would be completely right. And that's because um, a portion of the population um, does experience something called color blindness. So when we talk about people being color blind, what does that really mean? Well, when people are color blind, it means that at least one cone type in their retina is abnormal or missing, right? So some people are gonna be colorblind to reds and greens and others are gonna be colorblind to blues and yellows. Um, and a very small percentage of the human population are really only able to see grays. Okay, now uh, protonopia, or sometimes this is called people who, um, who experience protonopia are called protans, right? They have abnormal or missing L cones, okay? Now, these are sensitive to long wavelengths of light. And so it affects their ability to see red and green, okay? And so here would be, um, and, and, and <clears throat> you know, we can get into really kind of this idea of what is normal. Well, nothing is really normal because everybody has different amounts of rods and cones and things like that. Um, but this this was the image that I, I could find. So we're gonna say, okay, you possess all three cones here, okay? If you have protonopia, then you're missing the L cones. And so this is what kind of the range you would see. So it, it affects the ability to see red and green. And so what then would happen is you would see kind of these shades of browns and grays, right? Where we would see kind of red and green, okay? Now, Deuteranopia, and people who have deuteranopia are called deutrans. So if a deutran has an abnormal or missing M cone, Okay, which are sensitive to those medium wavelengths of light. Now this also affects the ability... to see red and green. Now, it was interesting because as a scientist, I was like, hey, um, <clears throat> these two things look really similar. And so I was, I was curious to see, the, the re, it reflects red and green, right? Um, and then the, the reference book I'm using, which is what is color, just kind of said, but not quite the same way. Um, and then left it as that. And so I did a little bit of research to see, you know, how is this different and just honestly kind of fell short. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to research that a little bit more, but um, at least as far as I can tell, while the cones are missing, the color scene are really, really similar. Okay. Um, now the, the next type of color blindness is tritinopia. Okay, and people who have this are called tritons, right? And these have abnormal or missing S cones, 
Okay. And so this affects the ability to see blue or yellow. Okay. Now, and you can see kind of what that would look like here. Okay. Now, um, the X chromosome is where the genes for our cones reside. So mutations in these genes when passed from mother to son are what cause most forms of color blindness. In most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, um, women have um, two X chromosomes. And so you only need really one healthy X chromosome to have normal color vision. So color blindness is much rarer in women. Um, it is rare, but it still happens, right? So it's just something to kind of, kind of be aware of. So, so far, we've been looking at the individual wavelengths of light that make up the visible spectrum, okay? Um, but we also need to talk about kind of some other colors that are not on the visible spectrum. And so these are called non-spectral colors, right? And so they arise from the mixing of individual wavelengths in the visible spectrum. So the mixing in, ooh, of individual wavelengths in the visible spectrum, okay, results in non-spectral colors, okay? And so these non-spectral colors include things like pink, right? Purple, which we see above. So those are examples. Um, what we would consider dull colors, right? Or dark colors, right? Uh, light colors, pastels, right? right? And grays and even some whites. Okay. So these are colors that non-spectral colors are not colors that are necessarily in the spectrum, but we mix them to get other colors. Okay. So one of the things that we use as scientists a lot of times as kind of a color delivery source is a pigment. And so we were going to talk about pigments more when we get into some of our later modules. But basically a pigment is a material that selectively absorbs some wavelengths. of light and then reflects other wavelengths of light. Now, the color of a pigment is determined by its molecular structure. Um, and so basically when we talk about this, Basically what happens is the arrangement of the electrons on the outside of the molecule dictate which wavelengths of light are absorbed and which are reflected. Okay. Now, so electrons, again, we've, we've talked about those in previous uh, modules 
are very important and that movement is important. Um, we will talk about this in a future model module, but I want to go ahead and, and put this out there. General pigments contain metals. Um, the, this particular book, which is what is color, where a lot of this is coming from, um, really lumps pigments and dyes together. Um, so when we talk about pigments, pigments contain metals. And we are going to talk about this in more in module five, but these would be what we would consider um, ionic bonds. Okay, most of the time, um, we're going to make a note of this here just in case you're ever referring back to it, um, and we'll define that again in module five. When we talk about dyes, most dyes now, as they're defined, do not contain metals. Right? These are mostly carbon-containing, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen-containing molecules, okay? And so these have what we consider covalent bonds. And again, we're going to dig around in that more in Module 5. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and start kind of laying the groundwork that, um, that dyes and pigments are different, okay? Now, let's continue to think about colors again. So we've talked about what, what different colors are, and we talked a little bit about this in uh, Module 2, but I just want to revisit it. So when we talk about the color black, black is the absence of all visible light, right? So in terms of a pigment, black is the absorption of all visible light. So no light reflects back to our eyes, right? And we can see this here, okay? No light is reflecting back. So this is a black surface. We're absorbing all of these wavelengths of light. Okay. Now, white um, is what we see when we see the full spectrum of visible light. So white objects reflect the full spectrum of visible light. And we see this here. Okay, where we've got the visible light coming in and then the white light is reflected. Now, pastel colors are a subcategory of non-spectral colors that we talked about before um, because they are actually a combination of every color of visible light reflected into our eyes, but at different intensities. Okay, so pastel colors are a combination of every color of visible ooh, yeah that's fine a visible light reflected into our eyes right but at different intensities Right, And so we can see an example of this here where if we look at a pink surface, so pink is a pastel color, what's happening is all of the colors are reflected back, but red is reflected back more, right? And so that, how we interpret that is we see pink, okay? Um, so I, I find that to be kind of, kind of interesting as far as colors. Now, our last kind of definition of colors before we start talking about color mixing are primary colors. So what are primary colors? Now, basically, if we were to look at this as a definition, right, of just primary colors, what they are, right, it's just a set of colors that when combined, produce a wide range of other colors. 
Now, contrary to what most of us are taught, there are no absolute primary colors, okay? Um, the designation of what is primary is really arbitrary and has changed depending on the prevailing ideas about color and vision, um, as well as pigments at a certain time in history, okay? Now, what we are going to try to do in this class is follow the convention of most color theory taught in, um, in today's uh, time, right, as far as naming primary colors. Um, the primary color for light are now considered to be red, green, and blue, okay? So when we look here, these are the primary colors for light, okay? Red, green, and blue, okay? Um, now, the primary colors for paint are now considered to be magenta, yellow, and cyan, okay? Um, I want you to notice something. Mixing light differs from mixing paint. So when we look at um, mixing light, when we mix all of the light colors together, we end up with a white. When we mix all of the paint colors together, we end up with a desaturated color, which is generally uh, how we interpret it as black or brown, um, depending on if there's um, more of one of these colors that are mixed together. Now, so that being said, um, <clears throat> we are gonna talk more about color mixing in our next screencast. Um, and we are also gonna do a lab um, where you mix colors of paint and you mix colors of light to see these effects.